Welcome back. We are back. We are back. This episode is epic. Is epic. As far as I know. Uh, Yeah, as far as we know. No. It hasn't happened yet, right? Well, you know what? I actually know. You might not know, but I I know. (laughs) And the listener or watcher, if you're whoever you are, strap in. You're going to love this one. Yeah, you're going to learn how to change behaviors, change your daily habits. And and have fun through the process. It's not a struggle fest. No. (laughs) That's the beauty of all this. No, this episode is going to make changing habits and your daily behaviors feel really, really, really easy. We have Mr. Habit himself, tiny habits that is. We have Mr. BJ Fogg here on the podcast with us, and he runs the Behavior Design Lab at Stanford. And uh, he's had folks like uh, one of the the co-founders of Instagram actually go through his training, you know, one of his classes. So he, he actually has invested over, what, 20 years of researching, teaching insights about human behavior. He's trained Fortune 500 companies with a focus on health, productivity, financial well-being. He's actually had a big... Uh, basically a lot of predictions about how technology is going to use persuasion and all this he's he's taken a lot of the principles from robert cialdini in his book influence Mm -hmm. uh which you know we're having robert on the on the show as well which is really cool so you'll hear a little uh little story about that inside of here but it's really fascinating how people weren't listening to him back in the day yeah well things have changed that was about 10 years ago so bj has been ahead of the times this whole thing so um he's talking about all that stuff. I mean, he's he's condensed all of his work over the last you know twenty years into Tiny Habits, mm-hmm. and that's his 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 book, which you definitely got to go. It's called Tiny Habits: The Small Changes That Change Everything. Yeah, no, it's a it's a pretty game changer of a book that I highly recommend everybody check out. He also has a uh, free like online course that you can go through mm-hmm. over at tinyhabits.com/join. So make sure you go through that free course first. Or There's no catch, no upsells, none of that stuff. They wanted to be super clear that and if you haven't gotten the book yet after going through that course you'll probably want the book yeah so. <laughs> it's like a five-day program basically it's your quick start the book is much thicker and more in depth but it's also very simple to read and very practical so mm-hmm. get both maybe start with tinyhabits.com slash join yes and go go meet them there and and follow what bj does like on twitter and all these other platforms anywhere bj is talking or he's he's always studying and experimenting with new things so uh, we're, we're planning on having him back actually for round two, uh, because he's doing some new interesting things around happiness and, and how that kind of shows up with habits. So, yeah. And we'll get into that in the episode as yeah, well. I want to give a shout out to Stefan Spencer. Thanks so much for Heck the yeah. connection to BJ. You rock. We love you, dude. Yeah, man. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. And, um, we, flow notes, flow notes. <laughs> so action guides, we call them as well. We don't have a great title, but you know what? We took the cliff notes those are in air quotes uh, for you of this episode so within two weeks they are totally free if you go to flowchartgroup.com plug in your email address it also gives you access to our facebook community we go to flowchartgroup.com and you will get those action guides what's up everybody you're listening to the hustle and flow chart podcast with your boys mount wolf and joe fear Showtime, BJ. <laughs> here we are. Yeah. <laughs> we all have this dramatic countdown. We we're waiting, awkwardly <laughs> looking at each other. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's awesome to have you on the show here, and thank you for your time. It's, it's super big honor, man. And you're always doing amazing things. I mean, we it's can't even keep track of all the studies you've been involved in, and uh, you know, obviously, Tiny Habits, your book that came out somewhat recently. Um, amazing read and very practical and something that you know is is seems like the foundation that everyone should have in terms of habits and behavioral change uh, for themselves or at least understanding themselves a little bit more huh well so. it, it, thank you for inviting me to be on your show and i think we're gonna have fun here and i think we're gonna maybe we even go to the edge a little bit here and be a little bit crazy and maybe i'll say some things i regret we'll see what happens <laughs> we'll see well that's our goal right right, right let's make news what? <laughs> yeah, well, we're super excited about this. We've spent the last 48 hours or so going down the BJ Fogg rabbit hole, watching TED oh, Talks, no. listening to podcasts, <laughs> oh, <no>. um, <laughs> uh, going back over our book notes, all, all of that stuff. So we've, we've got a, a, a lot of areas we want to try to cover with you. But I think where we want to start is we're really interested in how you got into behavior. Like what what mm. fascinated you about behavior? Was there some sort of catalyst that made you go down that rabbit hole? Yeah, I think so. I think it was my upbringing. Uh, being raised Mormon. So I was raised Mormon in Fresno, California. And a big part of that culture, at least uh, how I understood it, was about um, regulating your behavior and optimizing your behavior. 
And so I, I think if you really were to trace it back, it would be that. And my dad being the dutiful uh, Mormon father would sit us down. So I, I'm third of seven kids. And he would have these annual interviews with us, like, what are your goals for this year? And how can I support you? And very like awesome at the time. It was like, oh, dad, do we have to do this again? But you look back and you're like, good for my dad. And I didn't love it, but it certainly was just part of the culture I grew up in was optimizing your life. And you do that through behavior change and habits and so on. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, it's such a great conditioning you had at the time. It's definitely not common. I don't think, (laughs) you know, I, I did not grow up in a household like that, but just the constant improvement or that, that, you know, you have a North star or a vision of yourself that maybe you, you, kind of see in the future and your dad was helping you kind of create some maybe some stepping stones into the future and who that person is you know you can become that person yeah well it, it, i got to give credit to my mom too she's a musician she sang in the mormon tabernacle choir and she cajoled persuaded bribed me into practicing the piano every day and i know that may not seem very related but i think the discipline, especially when you're young, of practicing a musical instrument every day and failing and failing and drilling and getting better, that maps so very well to how you create habits in the real world. You're not going to be perfect playing this song. You're not going to be perfect at habits. So there's something that I'm recognizing more and more, you know, 40 years later, uh, that having essentially forced or bribed into practicing a musical instrument every day is really great training ground for lots of things, including behavior change when you're an adult. Yeah. Well, I knew you're a fan of the recorder now, right? Uh, instead oh my of- gosh. Don't give me, do not, my, my, my book agent said, BJ, you cannot play the recorder anymore in your press. <laughs> like I was in England playing the recorder, like on their version of NPR. And he's like, yeah. stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> you're piercing eardrums. <laughs> Well, you're probably the best recorder player out there. I know that was the instrument of choice for like, uh, you know, elementary school kids. But hey, it's great, man. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned, because there was another podcast, and I'm happy you brought up the instrument thing, that guitar. I think you, you referenced guitar. Was there a, because we're both guitar players, you have one? Yeah, I love it. And we got to bring them into our studio. I don't know why we have them, but... Ever since you said that, you know, I've I've been thinking about that and playing, just pick it up for 10 minutes and, you know, it turns into five, or, you know, 10, 15 and more. But yeah, what's your, I guess, what's, why guitar or any instruments like uh, specifically? Oh my gosh, this is, I'll be brief. There's so much. Music is this amazing thing. You guys know this. Everybody listening knows this. There's, there's something about music that's just amazing. And in fact, my lab just, my Stanford lab just, did a little piece of research and it was reported on last week in our weekly lab meeting. And music was the number one way that at least the people in our research were, they were using that to regulate their emotions. I mean, that's not a huge surprise. So music is big. I feel like creating or playing an instrument is just taking it to another level. Um, so there's a creative aspect there's the with guitar it's the vibration being right here with recorder and i play i play a steel drum there's other things i play but there's the vibrations and it just being right there and you being connected with it and moving that forward there's just something really hard to describe about that how great that is yeah, man, it, you you stole like it was like you had a weird camera in my living room or something last <laughs> night because I legit was I was feeling the vibrations in a different way and I was almost hugging the guitar. I mean, it was it was it's cool. I mean, it was a special guitar for me, but still, it had that connection, like you said. And I mean, how cool is that? Because we can, I feel like that leads to flow and patterns, and there's a lot to music in that sense. And very therapeutic. One thing I didn't recognize. So then. You know, I, I kind of move between the different instruments that I play. And yes, I still play keyboard. Uh, I have another keyboard arriving today, actually. Um, but what I realized in writing the book, Tiny Habits, and I didn't realize this, I was probably a year into writing it. Whenever I reached a tough passage, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I, would get, I would go out and I'd play the recorder in the living room, much to my partner's dismay. 
but it was the breathing and it was getting away from the writing that then refreshed and encouraged and energized me to go back and tackle it again. And it, it wasn't obvious that was happening, but about a year in, when I look back, it's like, that's exactly what I'm doing. I am refreshing by this woodwind instrument. And so I think that's moved me to, uh, so now I play a bass recorder, which is a large instrument, takes a lot of air. And that even emphasizes the breathing um, and the attention to detail more because it shows every single flaw that you're doing. But that, that, um, that breathe it, that breath work. And I think that's why I've moved away from guitar um, uh, some, and I'm focusing on recorder right now. Yeah. Oh, I'm, we're, we're very big fans of, of breath work, but we won't go down that rabbit hole now because <laughs> that's a whole nother one. Um, one, one of the things you, well, actually you said steel drum. Are you doing the hand pans? Yes. I've got a, a raft drum. I don't know if you know the raft drum. I've got the, the one in D, no. the D major. Okay. Yeah. And, and the D major, it's like almost impossible to sound bad. Anything <laughs> you do on that is going to sound good. And so I got that I for now. Yeah. Right, so buy D major. Got yeah, it. exactly. That's the hack there. <laughs> Well, you mentioned, you know, like it's an emotional thing, you know, a guitar and all this stuff, this connection. And that's what you I think that's a big piece of your book and all of your work is that uh, emotions are helping create the habits. It's not the motivation necessarily or the willpower, you know, strength of mind. And uh, so I thought that was that was a cool distinction that you just kind of brought up in passing here. Yeah. And let, let me. So as a kid playing the piano and I had to do it really early in the morning, I was not getting. The emo I was not being re reinforced through my emotions. It was quite the opposite. It was frustration. I didn't like it. I didn't like the pieces I was playing and so on. Had I been started on guitar and had I been playing popular pieces, I might have created the habit and my mom wouldn't have had to bribe me or threaten me and so on. Fast forward to today, when I play an instrument, I definitely get uh, a lift in my positive emotion. Um, it might be anxiety or frustration that dissolves. So it's a net gain in positive emotion, which is what reinforces or wires in the habit. So there's a big difference between me as a child playing, trying to play classical pieces on the piano versus me today playing whatever I want on whatever instrument I want and the emotional experience I have doing that. So playing music has just become a huge part of my life. And in fact, I'm a little obsessed with it and this has gone on for years this is not a phase this has gone on for years and it's like man if i could just play instruments all day long i would probably do that <laughs> right now you're talking to the choir you're preaching to the choir here yeah that's for sure you, you mentioned bribery do you think bribery is a good um <laughs> motivator for a new habit not for a habit but for achieving an outcome so there's there's a difference between a habit and then achieving an outcome and my mom um very smartly said, here's the Mormon hymn book. When you can play any hymn in this hymn book, I opened any page and you can play it, I will give you $100. Okay, so that's bribery. That's an incentive. It wasn't about a habit. It was about achieving an outcome that she could open to any page. And at that time, 100 bucks was a lot of money for a kid. And so she, that's why I say she bribed me. I mean, there's just so many things, but that was very motivating for me um, to get to the point where I can play anything in the book. Gotcha. So let, let, let's get into the, the meat because you've got this this kind of formula that, that you, you teach people. And I know motivation is, is one of the elements of the formula. Could, so can we just go ahead and, and break that down real quick in, in your words? And then maybe we can dig into that some more. Yes. And I'll give you even an extra credit answer here. If there If there's something I can add to my book, Tiny Habits, and I tried to add it to the paperback, but they wouldn't let me. It's, it's a graphic with a big circle that says behavior. So there's the set of behaviors. Inside of that would be a smaller circle that says habits. So habits are a type of behavior. The big category is behavior. Habit is a type. A one-time action is a different type. So all behaviors, whether it's a habit, a one-time action, or different kinds of, there's a variety of behaviors. I mapped out 15 ways behaviors can change. They all come down to these three components, motivation to do the behavior, the ability to do the behavior, and a prompt. And all behaviors, whether those habits or one-time actions or stopping behaviors are characterized by those three things, motivation, ability, prompt. And that's for all people, 
all behaviors, all ages, all cultures. It's a universal model that I call the fog behavior model. And that has been the foundation of my work since 2007. And that is what inspired and led to the tiny habits method was looking at my own model and understanding that in a new way. So breaking down this formula, when you say motivation, does motivation mean that you have a desire to achieve something or does motivation mean like this external motivation of like, you know, sticky notes on the wall of like, you know, go do your push-ups today. Yes, it can be all of that. So uh, I've broken down motivation into three core motivators, but most people just the way that we understand motivation in everyday life is accurate. Yeah. And motivation can come from different sources for sure. Well, that's what I find so fascinating is, uh, you know, behavior is, is the B in this whole equation. It's, you know, behavior equals motivation, ability, and, and um, prompts. And yeah, it's, it's interesting because I know in the book, you go deep into each one of these, you know, just for prompts, you know, just alone, there's so many different, what there's, I think, three core prompt types. Yeah. Out there, right. I love systems and I love making sense of abstract stuff, like giving it and, and I call those models. So you take something and you create a way of understanding it, whether it's a taxonomy or a flowchart or something like that. And as it turns out, motivation, ability, and prompt, all three of those can be understood uh, in terms of this model that I call pack person. You have person, action, context. So for example, motivation can come from the person, him or herself. Motivation can come from the context oh, I'm really afraid of COVID or, oh my gosh, I'm at a football game and everybody's cheering around me. And motivation can also be connected to the action, like carrot and stick. So that is one way of, and you can do the same with prompt and ability. So it turns out that those components, the person, the action, and the context are all important to account for whether you're looking at motivation or ability or prompt. So that model spans across the behavior model. Sorry, we geeked out a little bit here, but the point is, it's it can all it's all a system. Behavior is a system. Behavior changes a system. The way you create habits is a system. You don't have to guess, and that to me is like <laughs> super super exciting. And developing the system was like so fun. I mean, it's like pieces of the puzzle coming together, and it's like that fits. Boom! I know there's a piece missing here. It will come to me someday. Boom! There it is. And that just, I mean, it's like solving a huge puzzle and putting it all together. Well, that's what it felt like reading the book and understanding some of these models and then going back and really thinking how they apply in, into my life and to our lives as a business. And, you know, in society, you kind of start to notice some of the, the patterns. And I guess that's what you've done is you've laid out really nice frameworks for us to see patterns and then how to kind of hack them, I guess, or adjust ourselves, our behaviors and create a new behavior that is. Yeah. yeah. What? There, there, yeah. There's a, a, a I, I think this quote is like attributed to Scott Adams, but actually hearing it out loud, it almost sounds fairly derivative of your work. So it, it could go back to you, but he has a, he, he has a philosophy of don't set goals instead create systems that make getting to where you want inevitable. Just the systems work, they keep on happening. So therefore motivation is taken out of the equation. That's not the quote, but that's the essence of the quote. So I'm curious if maybe you can speak into that. Is that, is that sort of how you feel about, about goal setting or what's your opinion on it? I would agree with that statement for sure. Um, but you know, the, 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 there is a system and process for achieving any aspiration, any outcome. And, and, the, and rather than use the word goal, I use aspiration or outcome, depending on the type of goal that it is. And I'll just give an example. Where does motivation fit in? Ideally, you find, let's say that you want to um, uh, get more fit. Ideally, you find an exercise you already want to do. There are dozens and dozens of ways to get more fit. And this is part of the system and part of what I describe. And so you don't just assume you have to run for an hour a day. Ideally, you find a new behavior or habit that you want to do where the motivation's already built in. For me in my life, when I'm living in Maui, which is half the time, it's surfing. I don't have to like motivate myself to go surfing. When I'm here in California right now, I love rowing on hydro. It is so fun and awesome and I love it. 
And so that's the best approach. The best system is to find whether it's weight loss or sleeping better or being more productive is matching yourself with behaviors that will take you to that outcome, but behaviors you already want to do. So you can then check the box on motivation, say, bam, I already want to do this. Then it's the ability thing. How do I make this easier to do and make it easier to do? And then all you're left with is prompt. And you're like, okay, what's going to prompt me to do this? And in the tiny habits way, you use an existing routine, something you already want to do, or something you already do to be your prompt. Like brushing is the prompt for flossing, for example. Yeah, it's kind of stacking them up that way. Um, I and you know this is this is something that maybe other people have already heard. I know you have a TED talk, and this is in there, but the Maui habit, and that's that's the number one thing. I know I've been doing it ever since I, I learned about it from you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, started to do some squats after peeing as well. I know that's uh, <laughs> you know that's something you do push-ups, I believe. So it's um, the Maui habit. Like that's just an interesting way to kind of celebrate life. You know, like you woke yeah. up and now what's next? And it's almost like you could stack from that. Can you explain that uh, process in the morning a little bit? The, the, the habit that I named the Maui habit was really quite an accident how it came across, but now thousands of people do it. It's the only habit that I prescribe in my book, Tiny Habits, because everything else in that book is about creating any habit that you want. So the Maui habit goes like this. As soon as you get up in the morning, so it's after my feet touch the floor in the morning, I will say, it's going to be a great day. Bam, seven words, simple. And it's, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist, I'm a behavior scientist, and I know, and I mean, and I'm skeptical about things. And so I know people listening, oh, that sounds like a lot of woo-woo, but man, try it, you know, try it in your life. And it has just an unexpectedly big impact in life. If you just say, it's going to be a great day. Well, what are some science bombs, I guess, that we can give us layman's else that would maybe uh, help someone that is still skeptical or like, I'm not feeling anything after doing this. Like, are there a couple things that are rooted in science that you found it out? Well, let me, you know, we almost, when I say we, I mean, my agent and my agent's team almost called uh, my book something else that had to do with like, your life is this science lab. Okay, so we we're going to call it the change lab. Um, science is what it is. It's observation. It's careful observation. That's what science is. You know, it's, it's not like it got, it has to be an academic publication or that somebody with a credential does it. It's essentially careful observation and finding the patterns in those observations and then quantifying it possibly if you can. Um, so I would just encourage everybody to make your own life this change lab and do science on yourself and just observe, just observe what happens when you say it's going to be a great day, careful observation, and then do it over a few days at least, and then observe what, what, what's changed and what was different. So I, I just, um, I'm a pretty big believer that just reading academic scientific work doesn't change anybody's behavior. You've got to put it into practice. So that's why I'm going to this practical path and become an observer, a careful observer of your own life. And in that way, basically it becomes your own like little research lab Do science on yourself. Isn't that the best thing too, especially when you start to understand some of these little tips and tricks that ha someone else has perfected. And, and in your case, many others, you passed it on. It is fun because you can look at yourself as like, I can, I can kind of tweak myself, optimize in all these different ways that I feel deficient in potentially. Well, what's hard about just doing it on yourself, it's, it's an N of one, which is small, but then you don't have a control group. <laughs> it's like True. versus <laughs> what? And so you have to reflect and say, okay, what is different this morning compared to a typical morning, the thousands and thousands of mornings I've had. So you have to be able to do that kind of thing. So yes, it's not like uh, a true experiment where you manipulate variables and have a, um, at least two conditions, but you can tune in. Do you know what, you guys, I did this with food. Um, years ago when I was, after I developed the tiny habits method and I was working on my weight issues and man, I never thought I, I started tuning in to how the food felt when I ate it. 
which I would never, I thought that was like woo woo and how could you possibly feel that and so on. But if you are careful and start tuning in, you will, at least I did anyway, I can't say everybody will. I started noticing differences of how the foods felt at that moment and shortly after eating them, which dialed in which foods were on my game plan and which foods were not. Once I did that, the weight loss thing was easy. And it didn't take discipline because I knew which foods I could eat as, as much as I wanted. And I knew which foods I needed to avoid. And so I guess, uh, I guess I'm just saying something that I thought would be like, no, you can't really feel what, you know, you eat a peanut or a handful of peanuts and what effect does it have on you? And guess what? For me, it does not have a good effect. Sugar does not have a good effect. Um, and then fermented foods, sauerkraut and kimchi, amazing effects. So guess what? No peanuts, <laughs> very little sugar. And I do a whole bunch of fermented foods, not because I read it somewhere, but because I just learned to observe my reaction to those foods and I just dialed it in. Yeah. No, I think a good uh, way to start for everyone is eat a bunch of ice cream, you know, see the sugar intake, like, okay, yeah. <laughs> now you'll start feeling your body if you don't feel it already. <laughs> and then maybe go back from there, you know, yeah. if you're feeling out of touch. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I do not, I do not have a system or method for tuning in. Cause I, I only did it on me with tiny habits. I coached over 40,000 people personally. I mean, it, I stopped counting at 40,000. So, so I have seen the patterns. You said the word patterns earlier. I've seen all by 10,000 people. I gave a, a talk at an academic conference called society for behavioral medicine. And the title of my talk was what I learned coaching 10,000 people in habits after 10,000 people, which took me about a year and a half. Um, I don't think I saw any new patterns after that. So the remaining tens of thousands I did, it was, you know, there's only so many patterns that happen, but once you see them, then you see them again and again, and it just really becomes undeniable about what works and what doesn't work for creating habits. And that's to say, I don't have, tons of tons of you know how do you tune into your body's reaction food i don't know how to tell somebody to do that but i do know how to tell people how to create habits yeah i, I want to kind of define um tiny habits a little bit so something fairly universal is people want to get in the habit of working out every day right obviously working out every day is not a tiny habit so how would you how would you break that up into a how would you define a tiny habit and then how would you kind of break up getting in the habit of working out every day into tiny habits well, tiny habits is a method for bringing new habits into your life. And you take any habit you want and you make it really small, tiny. You make it so small that even on your worst days, you can do it. Um, for a workout, for a lot of people who wanted to walk, they found that the tiny, the, the thing was just to put on their walking shoes. That was the habit. And if they ended up walking, that was extra credit. That was a bonus. They didn't have to, but they just had to put on those shoes. Um, the, so you take any habit you want, you make it so easy and uh, straightforward. Um, and then you find where does it fit naturally in my life? So you design it into your routine, just like, um, oh, I have some flowers. So, um, a friend came over, and I met his wife and he, he trained with me and, and she's doing stuff and coaching and they brought me over flowers. And it's like, okay, where am I going to put these flowers? I'm designing it into my environment. That's what you're doing with new habits. It's like, where am I going to put this new habit? Design it into what you already do. Um, so you find what it comes after and then you wire it in through emotion. So it is, there's three hacks. You hack the behavior, you make it super tiny. You hack what reminds you, you use an existing routine to remind you, and you hack what forms the habit, which is emotions. And you do that through a technique that I call celebration. And I love the celebration concept. It's kind of like the Maui habit in the morning. You know, you're celebrating a new day in yourself. But I love the, I love the idea of when you do, a, I guess, a behavior that, that you're proud of, celebrate it. I'm awesome. I'm freaking great. You know, and it plants it right in that subconscious, it seems like. Well said, and I'll give an example of that. I don't have a habit of wiping the kitchen island. I just not designed that in as a habit. We live between Maui and here, and when you change locations, your habits change. But yesterday, from this coffee cup, or not this one, but a coffee cup, 
there were some little coffee like marks on the counter. So I got out the the washcloth and I wiped it off. And as I was doing it, I was like, good for you, BJ. And I looked at how much cleaner it looked after that. And what that does is it makes that behavior more likely in the future. So by self-reinforcing, so I both did a little self-talk, not out loud, but like, oh, good, good for me. And I took a moment to see the impact, to see that I was successful in making that look better. That's going to make that habit of wiping the counter uh, stronger. And we, we can do that. So with tiny habits, you are deliberate and you design it. But to your point, you can celebrate any behavior that you want to make more frequent or more likely to happen. And the stronger your feeling of success, the faster that behavior becomes a habit. So it's, yeah, even if it's the smallest thing, you know, taking out the trash, whatever it might be, it's like, yes, I did that today. I did it on time without rushing for the truck that's coming down the street. <laughs> but you know what? It could even be something that's, yes, it could be even more abstract. Uh, but let's say your uh, husband or wife does something that annoys you, but you don't react. And you and in the moment of not reacting, you could be saying, oh my gosh, I'm doing it. Good for me. I am. I'm sticking to my game plan of, you know, just, just, just tell yourself, help yourself feel successful. And that will help that behavior become more predominant in your life. Do you have any advice or tips for just sort of not derailing your um, your tiny habits? So, for example, you know, let, let's say I, I, I every day I, I go to the bathroom, I brush my teeth, I put on my shoes and I go for a run. And then I do that for a couple months straight. And then I go to Cancun for a week and just lounge around on the beach in Cancun and that habit falls off. Do you have any tips for, you know stopping the derailment when when the environment or your daily yeah. actions change embrace the fact that you're on vacation and your habits are going to change <laughs> yeah i mean your habits are very driven by your context and you know so i talked about the person the action the context that also applies to habits it's you doing the exercise in the context which is your home context when you go to cancun it's a different context so that means it's a different habit and so the fact that it doesn't happen, just be really compassionate with yourself. So I guess my answer is one way to de deal with derailment or not achieving what you'd hoped is to just give yourself a ton of comp compassion and just say, hey, I didn't do it today. Well, I didn't do it on a vacation. That's fine. I'm doing other things. Say you get back home and it doesn't happen. It's like, hey, I'm transitioning back. That's okay. I'll do it tomorrow. So just really getting rid of this black and white thinking and see your habits, your set of habits, as this thing that will evolve. The fact of the matter is right now, I'm not doing push-ups after I pee. I am doing squats. I'm doing a very deep squat because I'm trying to like just be able to like sit on my haunches alone. And that's cool. And then I'll go back to push-ups at some point. And so I think having this flexibility with your habits and evolving them in a way that suits your life, that's the best way to go because our desires change, our environment changes, the seasons turn over. And so um, look at habits is, is something that will uh, change over time and don't resist it. Go, go with what you want. You know, I, I really want um, the flexibility of doing deep squats and I'll, I'll say why. Uh, more than I want the, the additional, I mean, I've done thousands and thousands of push-ups. One, one reason I want that is because when I'm in Maui, I love being alone by myself. So I'll find a coast, you know, part of the coastline and the, to look into the tide pools and stuff, you got to squat down. And if I can go and like just squat down for minutes and hopefully half hour, an hour in the future without pain, I'm going to love that. So I'm, 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 I've shifted it up so I can achieve that outcome that's more important to me right now than the, the kind of strength I would get from push-ups. I like that. And that's um, you said something, I think it was towards the beginning of your book, that 
it's typically an approach that is wrong. It's like a design flaw, you know, in, in establishing a new habit um, that, you know, it's not a personal flaw. You, you said it's not a personal, I mean, because I could see how, you know, if you're on vacation, not doing your workout routine that you feel like you should continue when you're on a vacation, living it up. It's like I could see self-sabotage or criticism starting to creep in. And then that could probably lead to derailment later on. Well, there's that whole like Jerry Seinfeld thing where he was like, don't break the chain, put the thing on the yeah, calendar. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I've always had that in my head of like, he's I don't wrong. want to break the chain. You know, ah, he's wrong. <laughs> you know, Seinfeld was not very helpful in that episode <laughs> with people creating habits. You don't have to be. Per nobody's perfect. Just like me learning to play the piano. If the measure was, here's your new piece. You got to be perfect playing that piece. Nobody is. Nobody's perfect speaking a new language. A baby is not perfect in walking. Um, creating habits is a process. The more you practice it in the right way, the better you get. So the faster you can acquire them. Like I'm really good at creating habits. Um, but you are discovering, one, do I really want this habit? Two, where does it fit naturally in my life? And three, how, does, how do I feel successful about this new habit? And um, so the idea of that you've, you've got to, you know, that there's a streak and you have to keep the streak going. That's not true. Um, the idea that you only can change one habit at a time. That's not true. The idea that it's repetition that creates the habit. That's not true. There's a whole bunch of, um, myths that are unhelpful. And I guess I'll end my little speech with this. Um, Feeling bad does not help you change in a lasting positive way. And so a big, big theme of my work in the book and in my research now at Stanford more and more is you change best by feeling good, not by feeling bad. And positive emotions are how you create the habits and how you um, create lasting change and how you transform your life in bigger ways. So that's why... Oh, I didn't know if I'll call it the most important research project. Maybe it is in my lab. It's about how do people upregulate positive emotions. And so now we have over 200 techniques for that. I think it's the biggest list ever. ever. And we are um, going to start teaching it as part of our research, teaching it, see people how they apply it and so on. So 10 years ago, I would have never thought I would be talking a lot about emotions, uh, but now they're just, I, they're central to habits and they're central to our happiness. And emotions is a very messy landscape academically. And we don't have to get into that mess to recognize the importance of positive emotions for our own well being and flourishing, but also for the people around us. In fact, that's one of the things in the, the new class that I'm teaching at Stanford, which is Tiny Habits for Humor and Happiness. Tiny Habits for Humor and Happiness. One of the things in the course description is that I want the students to become the source of positivity for people around them. Now more than ever, people need that. And in the course I'm teaching, yes, I want the students to be happier and want them to bring more humor into their lives, but for them to be that source of positivity and give other people hope, that's like the most important thing I think I can be doing with those students during the time I have with them. Well, there is a, so two things. Uh, I saw your Twitter and you know, when you announced this class, I think it was yesterday at the time of this recording, it immediately made me jealous that I'm not a Stanford student. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and I saw a couple other people asking, Hey, is there a way that we can, you know, so I just, I just, I just pray that uh, this thing works out and you publish it as another <laughs> book or a cool video or something where the rest of the world can <laughs> experience a little bit. Um, you know, I don't know if that's in the future, but well, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it will come out in some form. What I'm hoping, I mean, the first time, so I always teach a new class at Stanford. I've only, there's only one class in 20 years that I've repeated. I always come up with a new topic, but this is one that I hope to repeat and I hope to scale, not just within Stanford students, but at other universities and, and even outside of academic communities. But the first time you do something, you got to make it simpler. So I can't have guests and I can't have industry visitors. I've just got to make sure I do a, a pretty good job on this class and hopefully a great job. Uh, but when you add uncertainty, like 
people outside of Stanford and a lot more people, it makes it harder. So for this time, I got to just Stanford students and just uh, figure it out and then revise it, improve it and scale it. Well, there's something that, um, and then I think you have something, but there is a, I was listening to one of these podcasts with you and you didn't say this specifically. I kind of wrote down, is this BJ's mission? You kind of kind of said it a little bit here. Uh, but what I wrote down through this is, you know, through changing habits, people are going to diminish their fear. And it's, it seems like you have, you know, that's when without the fear, there's more opportunities, fear shuts you down and you have more empathy. And it sounds like kind of like what you just said, that's what you want to put out into the world. Yes, that's right. I'll just flip what you said over a little sure. bit. It's the same thing. Fear and hope are opposites. Fear is the anticipation of something bad happening. Hope is the anticipation of something good happening. So yes, diminishing fear, but another way to say it is my life's work in some ways, in many ways, is about giving people hope, not false hope, but hope that they, by giving them experiences where they see they can change, they can create habits, they can improve their life, they can feel more positive emotions. So it's not like a pep talk or a motivational speech. It's I teach people how. Um, how do you how do you achieve what you set out to achieve? And how do you feel happier and more positive every day? And that, you know, if I were to add one more H to that title, Tiny Habits for Humor and Happiness, Hope would be the other H. But then it made it too long. But that is <laughs> definitely, that is definitely what I'm about. Yeah, I, I'm, I was curious if we can get like a little sneak peek of what might be taught in the humor, happiness, and hope course that you're doing. Like, what what sort of habits are 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 we talking about here that you're going to try to instill in others? Yeah, well, we're focusing on three books. One is my book, Tiny Habits, um, which is the how how do you the how to create habits. Then for humor. We are uh, focusing on a book called Humor Seriously, written by two of my Stanford colleagues. A lovely book, a super funny read. And then the students will read that book and we'll have the authors do a guest visit to class. And they'll then extract from the book, like what habits. So they'll take the what from the Humor Seriously book and then create habits using the how from Tiny Habits. And then the third book that we're focusing on is a, a new one that isn't out at this very moment, but bam, here it is. The Gap in the Gain by Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy. And, and this will become the foundation for talking about happiness. Uh, so there's so many ways to look at happiness, but this brand new book and the concepts here about focusing on the gain that you've made and not the gap that remains, I think is so important for Stanford students right now. Um, and so we'll take the concepts in this book and put them into the tiny habits method. And so in this class, like pretty much all the classes I teach at Stanford, I haven't solved every little thing. It's a discovery with the students. So I'm inviting the students to join me on this journey that nobody's ever had before that characterize all my classes like oh nobody's done this before and together we're going to figure it out and we're going to create and understand things in ways that have never happened before which a lot of stanford students love that kind of thing i know i do and so it's those three books plus some other readings but it's really those things um that we're going to put into practice and so by december i will have very specific answers for you. Like what's, what are the best tiny habits for humor? <laughs> what are the best tiny habits for happiness based yeah. on the gap in the game? Um, but I'm not trying to solve that because I want to bring in the Stanford students and make them, um, make them carry the burden with me. Like I'll, I'll, I'll reframe that. Give them the opportunity to discover stuff and not just be like, uh, spoon fed in a lecture or something like learn how to discover that's most of my classes are that learn how to discover new stuff. So, so out of the, the, the 10,000 habits you you've helped people build into their daily lives, are there any habits that come to mind that you've worked with people on that really you've that created a noticeable improvement in quality of life for people? Oh, there's, there's, there's a lot. Um, I mean the push up one, um, there have been, Oh, 
I didn't count, but probably dozens of people that have emailed me said, oh, I started with two push-ups, and now here's all these great things that have happened to me. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, physical things, confidence, their career changed. I mean, what surprises people, and we see this week after week. So there's a five-day program in Tiny Habits that runs Monday through Friday every week. And we measure the results every weekend, and every Tuesday we have a meeting, meeting about the previous week. And so we see all the results. And people are like, oh my gosh, even though I was just focusing on tiny things, I can see just within a few days how big these things are. So um, habits that relate to quality sleep, and let me give you one of mine. I mean, sleep really, really matters. So one of mine is after I feel like I want to get up in the middle of the night because I get restless at two or three, I lay back down on my bed for 15 seconds. And if I still want to get up, I do. But most of the time, I lay down and I'm like, oh, I don't, I, I don't want to get up. This feels really good. So there's dozens of habits around sleep, but that's one that I do to overcome whatever that drive is or reason that I feel like I need to get up. In terms of um, eating, Finding a snack, a go-to snack that's on your game plan and getting really good at accessing that snack instead of looking at other temptations. For me, that's cauliflower, it's broccoli, it's there's certain nuts that are absolutely on my game plan. Um, and then in terms of relationships, I mean, we could go on with these categories, but relationships really, really matter. And in the listening arena, a habit that is such a great one to have is when somebody says something, whether it's at the dinner table or a party or even a stranger, rather than you jumping in and adding your piece. Um, so the tiny habit recipe goes like this. After somebody shares something about their life with me, I will say, that's interesting. Tell me more. That's interesting. Tell me more. Bam. You can strengthen close relationships. You can turn strangers into friends just by saying, that's interesting. Tell me more in a sincere way. You got to be sincere and then really listen. Ooh, that's good stuff. And <clears throat> excuse me, that, that kind of relates to this thing that this might seem a little off topic or it's going back in time for you. But uh, like in two days, we're interviewing Robert Cialdini. I got his book, his new book over here. It's amazing. Yeah, they just sent it to us, and it's fabulous. It's it's huge. It's two hundred and twenty extra pages on the back of it, is what I heard. Um, tell tell us about how he or his influence book played a big role because the whole I think it's so damn fascinating that you and technology, you know, I think it's ten plus years ago you were predicting behavioral change in people through our devices, you know, technology, and it was using his principles. In nineteen ninety three, as a doctoral student at Stanford. Uh, and really, the experiment started in 1994. I took the principles from his book, and I designed true experiments to see if computers could flatter you and have impact. If you would give favors back to computers, reciprocity, whether computers could be teammates. So the principles in his book, and at the time he had six, now he has seven in this new book, and the new book's amazing. Um, but back then there were these six principles and I essentially took those human, human influence dynamics and ran experiments to see if computers could use reciprocity, could use praise, could use team dynamics to change people's attitudes and behaviors. And the answer was yes. These principles were so powerful that even though you knew you're interacting with the computer, you would still be influenced by them which then led me to go, oh my gosh, this is great. And this is terrible. Um, you know, there's and, and so 1990, well, eight, I did the first publication saying, hey, everybody, we have a real problem here. Machines are going to be designed to influence our attitudes and behaviors, machines that can operate autonomously. And there's a, we can use this power for good, but there's going to be bad uses of this. So that was me trying to get people to pay attention in 1998. Nobody really cared at that point, unfortunately. Oh man, that's, it's so wild to think back because of how prevalent it is now and every single platform taking these persuasion principles, 
probably a lot of your work as well in these studies you've done with groups and, and patterns and habits. Yeah. It's crazy, but man, I'm sure they're listening now. All right. Hopefully they are. <laughs> the, the, the main uh, principle of influence that I've advocated is simplicity. Simplicity. That That's really been my theme for even before the behavior model, I recognize Everything in the tech world that was working was drop dead simple. So that's what I preached to my students was simplicity. Yeah, I'll bring that up to, to Robert Cialdini <laughs> in a couple of days and, and say we chat. Yeah, he needs one more principle. <laughs> um, Get an eighth. He, he, you guys, good for you for bringing him onto your show. This is very it important. Is. I hope everybody tunes into that show. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Well, both of you, I mean, it's this whole week, we've kind of been like pinching ourselves a little bit because you guys are rooted in so much studies and in science and all the experiments you've done. And, and it's just fascinating. So, I mean, you've obviously left breadcrumbs and more all around the globe in many ways. So thank you. Is there yeah. anything that you want to wrap up on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, so Tiny Habits is the book. Everybody should read the book. Everybody should pick it up and read it. Maybe just start with one page a day. Just after uh, you brush your teeth, uh, go read one page. <laughs> but everybody needs to pick up Tiny Habits and read that book. Is there anywhere else you would want people to go or check out after listening to this episode? Um, there's a free five-day program in Tiny Habits. And you have a real human coach that I've helped train in that. And it's free and there's no hidden motive. This is the program that I developed in 2010, launched in 2011. James Clare took the program in 2013. Wow. That got him interested in habits. Um, so do the five-day program at tinyhabits.com. And there's a bunch of free resources and stuff that's out there. Um, but just, just know that changing your life by creating new habits is easier than you think if you do it in a certain way. And you don't have to spend hours and hours. I mean, the five day, the free five day program is probably 35 minutes total during the week. And it teaches you a whole bunch of skills of change that you can then leverage for the rest <laughs> of your life. The book is about, if you're listening to it, it's an 11 hour. Uh, so that's, you know, much longer than a 35 minute five day program. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I would point people there. And if you they want to know more about my work in general, bjfog.com is the the launching point for Tiny Habits and my Stanford work and other stuff. Awesome. Well, BJ, it's been a pleasure, like we said already. Thank you very much, man. Thank As you. my voice is going out now. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you very much for all the work to come, too, because I know you have some cool stuff. And I can't wait to hear about the happiness oh, yeah. class. I can't, I can't <laughs> wait to see what comes out of those studies you guys do. Yeah, That's going to be fun. So. Well, thank you. Maybe we do a follow-up in December Ooh. or once the class wraps, and then I can give you the specific details of what we discovered and the impact. I'll be measuring, of course, the impact on the students because yeah. I love measuring everything. Um, well, that's an exaggeration. I, I, I love measuring things. I don't measure everything. I love measuring things. So, you know, in uh, after the course is over, I'd be happy to share what we discovered and what the uh, results were. That'd be amazing, BJ. Thank you. Okay. Let's do it, man. All right. Thanks, you <laughs> right. guys. Great one. All right. All right. Man, oh man, that was fun. That was <laughs> that good. was seriously fun. That was one. Of, that was an episode that we've been we've been working on making happen for a while, and yeah. we were super pumped about it. And we weren't lying. I mean, the last forty eight hours uh -huh. have been like. BJ Fogg immersion. <laughs> totally. I mean, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it, we had a chat with BJ slightly after and, and, um, you know, made a little, made a little video, kind mm -hmm. of a little endorsement thing. So that was really cool. BJ. And, you know, he's like, seemed like they're really into this topic too. I'm like, and it, it's true. We, we were, are, yeah, we were yeah. like so deep into this, even before deep diving into BJ and all the latest and greatest and tiny habits, which definitely pick up that book. Mm. Um, you know, it's pretty obvious where you can find it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, New York times bestseller. So it's a, it's a book that you definitely want to get like, pretty much book. all of the other, I won't name names, but pretty much all of the other like habit books mm. that have come out over the last several years are all sort of based off of his work. Mm. Like, yeah, well, most of it is his work that other people just built on and and taught and tried to pass off as their own. Mm. Won't name any names, but mm. he is the he's the godfather he's of this stuff. Definitely mm. the godfather. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, definitely, yeah. Go check out the free course. You know, go go there. Uh, what was that? BJ. It's uh, tinyhabits.com. Yeah. Right? So tinyhabits.com yep. is where you can get the uh, the course. BJ Fog is a little bit more about him. So it's both Fog of those with, sites. Fog with two G's, just to clarify. Double G. Double G on the F O G G. Yeah. Similar 
to Snoop Dogg, right? But it's I like fog. that. Yeah. I'm sure he gets that. All the time. <laughs> um, man, I just I, I think what so we've been immersed in this kind of thing, and you know, and not only just habits, but more behavioral change and understanding who we are and understanding what patterns don't we like so mm-hmm. much or or behaviors. And, you know, for a long time, I know, like, we've talked about where we've struggled with certain patterns. And, you know, that we talked about this, but, like, definitely have been some self-sabotage in the past. Yeah. And criticisms. And it's like, well, but it doesn't have to be so hard. I think for me, like, I know me personally, I don't give myself grace when stuff falls apart, right? Mm. Like, I, I, that was a a, a personal question for me, right? I was in a very, very good workout routine for months and months and months and months, and then I took a trip to Cancun, and... (laughs) Oh, so that was a legit... I didn't know the example was... (laughs) Yeah, no, the example was right out of my own life. So um, I went to Cancun, and I actually... The interesting thing is I actually maintained the workout routine through Cancun, but when I came uh, home, I didn't keep up with it. Interesting. Like okay. I like I was so sort of in my head when going to Cancun that this is going to fall apart. This this routine's going to fall apart that I actually stuck with it every day while I was there. <laughs> and then I came home and I was so exhausted from all the travel. Like I think I told you the story. We got in from Cancun at like 2 in the morning because mm. of, you know, the the border was all backed up and just we had issues. And so the next day I was just like so exhausted that I just I, I can't even, right? Like that's that's what the kids say these days, right? I can't and even. then you couldn't even further days after that. Too. Yeah, and then after that, I just kind of never picked back up with the habit again, right? So that's that that was where that question came from was like a a personal thing that pops up for me. It's like I can get into a good habit, I go on a vacation, and then I sort of fall out of it, and then I start to like beat myself up when I get home Mm. of like, man, why can't I get back into it when I got home? Well, I missed the last three days. What's what's another day? And then the next thing you know, you it's been months, you know, <laughs> yeah, man. it's, it's, it's crazy when you start to think of that, because when you look at yourself, you're like, wait, hold on. I was not helping myself in that scenario. It was the, so, it was the, the beating myself up mentally right. that caused me to not do it. Me going, ah, you suck. You skipped a day. You already broke the chain. Yeah, right. Uh, and Seinfeld. then it was strikes already again. broke the train. <laughs> like that, that concept of breaking the chain. Like I can see why he says it, it's, it doesn't work. It's, it, sure. it's not great because if you break the chain, that sort of, uh, pressure that you put on yourself mm. of, breaking the chain just kind of makes you at least in my scenario it made me kind of go well the chain's already broken so what's the big deal if the 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 broken link goes a little bit longer right and then that broken link just goes longer and longer so i do think that that don't break the chain chain concept can be detrimental to Mm -hmm. your progress with building behaviors it puts pressure on you maybe unneeded pressure maybe it's on a thing that it wasn't life or death. I mean, yeah, maybe there's certain things in your life where you really should not break the chain. Yeah, like keep <laughs> you know, brushing pick, your teeth, people. Picking up your kids from school, yeah. uh, things like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're right, you know. it's there's a, I think that's, that that was a kind of an aha moment, even though I, f- I feel like when you kind of step back, you're like, duh. Like, mm-hmm. you probably should feel good when you want to improve some part of your life, some aspect. Uh, but But I think... I don't know if it's a natural behavior that a lot of us are, or maybe it's conditioning from the past Mm -hmm. where it's just like, oh, you're so hard on yourself or that you're, you know, you're so goal, goal oriented. Well, also the habit wasn't tiny enough, That's right? Like the habit for me was an entire 45 minute workout routine, Mm -hmm. right? And so when you come back and you try to keep going back with that habit, it, you know, yeah. it, it, it feels big. It feels monumental after a while where had my habit been like, when I get back, I'm just going to try to get into my garage and just do one, one barbell press, mm-hmm. right? Like, and that, that's the habit. Just go for one. And then what inevitably happens is once I'm in the garage and I start working out, I don't really want to stop. I'm going to, I'm going to do more. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's like, get that momentum built up. And I know yeah. that's what BJ talks about in tiny habits a lot. Extra is- credit. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the extra credit's gonna probably always happen for the most part if you're feeling all right. Yeah. Well, I've I mean, talked about the one push-up thing too, uh-huh. and I, I never realized it until now. But that's you know that's BJ Fogg's work. I, I originally heard about it because Tim Ferriss was interviewing Matt Mullenweg, and he followed this process, which he probably <laughs> learned from you know BJ. I'm sure, Fogg there's or, been a lot of mashup at this point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he had this thing of I just try to shoot for one push-up every day, and mm. I, I never only do one push-up, but I try to shoot for one push-up every day, and mm. I and I did that for a little while fell out it after a while but and then yeah. celebrating i think that's the other piece of yeah. it is like celebrating all these micro wins in your behaviors if it's a behavior that you haven't you're not normally doing but you really want to do you do that one push up you're like heck yeah i'm freaking awesome yeah. i did that you know or maybe a little internal thing so you're not going to make people around you a little bit like who's this guy yeah <laughs> but those little wins i mean can come in every little action you do 
Yeah. Like we celebrate it right after uh, finishing this podcast. We, we do. ourselves. We do that almost every single time after we, we hit stop. We give ourselves a high five. Sometimes it's not after we hit stop. Sometimes it's before we hit stop. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. I mean, it's it's really cool. And I we bring that into our environment because mm-hmm. it's up to us to create really solid energy here. Yeah. And, and that 100%, I mean, B- BJ talked about, he didn't say the ripple effect, but essentially it seemed like that's what he, that's his mission, you know, is, is the hope. Mm-hmm. But it's it's spreading that that ripple effect, so it passes on to others. I mean, I feel like we generate our own fun. That's why we have stickers around here that says this is going to be fun. Yeah, that's a mental reminder. The high fives after we freaking do the thing that we wanted to do. Yeah, even if it wasn't a great interview, this one was amazing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> At least we think so. Yeah, and um, and then from there, I feel like it ripples out into the people watching and listening to us too. Totally agree. So yeah, man. BJ, thank you. You're a rock star. We were planning for round two. That is the plan. Uh, ideally, in uh, maybe later in the year, we'll we'll circle back on the happiness front. Yeah, I would love then. love love to talk about like what he yeah, learned man. researching happiness and habits in that combo. And I want to be a Stanford student. Dang I know. It. <laughs> I also love everything that uh, Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy put out. So right? that other book that he uh, he mentioned. I got it up. Yeah, I know it's not live yet. I don't think uh, at least the time of this recording, but it's on the wish list. The gap in the game. Let's see. Is it coming? Uh, da, 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 da. I guess you. Uh, I don't know. We, oh, it's pre-order. Yep, it's pre-order. Uh, so October 19th, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. Cool. There you go. But for now, start with Tiny Habits. Start with Tiny Habits. Get that at tinyhabits.com. Go through the free course, uh, the five-day thing. Actually, we should do that. Or I want to do that. Yeah, A little challenge. And yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> check out uh, like YouTube. There's some good stuff on TED Talks. You know, BJ's a lot of content out there. So yeah, go very check prolific them out. online. You can find a lot from Definitely. Him. Yeah, so um, get the action guide to this episode. We're always taking notes, and uh, if you made it this far, you probably have a lot of ideas. Well, they're probably in the notes as well. Mm -hmm. If you wrote down uh, some, cool. Well, we got it all covered. Go to flowchartgroup.com, and as I cough, sorry, (laughs) plug in your email address. Within two weeks of this episode going live, you'll get those action guides for free. And get to join our Facebook group. Flowchartgroup.com. Yes, and And then also we are supported by Easy Webinar. Yeah, dang right we are. There long buddies of ours yeah easy webinar is a great platform for recording all of your webinars and doing live webinars and doing live streams Mm -hmm. and creating the registration pages for those live streams and webinars and they do it all and the reporting's cool all the dashboards all that fun stuff that happens you know we're not going to do it justice as well as going to easywebinar.com slash hustle is going to do you justice and if you go to easywebinar.com slash hustle they're giving you a discount for being a hustle and flowchart listener so Mm -hmm. make sure you go to that url and and they're going to hook you up. Easywebinar.com slash hustle. Easywebinar.com slash hustle. Uh, you, know, you know us. We have uh, everything we package up in the way we do our podcast, business, and all the fun networking and deal structures, affiliate marketing, all that stuff is in our core training program. It's more of like a... It's a it's a business and a I don't like to say it. I, we don't have a good term for this thing. It's just everything we do is in Pod Hacker. That's pretty much our, if you're a podcaster a and you take it seriously, you need to be a Pod Hacker. So go check out PodHacker.com. Go give it a little peek and uh, just know <laughs> there's actually a lot more than what you see on the page. We should probably update the page because we've had some really cool guest experts around all these folks that have been helping us grow the show, have us think differently with the brand and, and what we're doing here. So if you want to learn, go to PodHacker. Yep. And this should be the last call to action. <laughs> Hustle and flowchart.tv. Go watch us on YouTube. If you're listening in oh, on yeah. the podcast, if you're on Spotify, iTunes, that's awesome. We love you, but we're also making video versions and we're really, really trying to dial in our YouTube channel over at Hustle and flowchart.tv. That'll just redirect you to YouTube. Uh, so go there and subscribe on YouTube if you haven't Woo-hoo. already. That could, If you really, really, really want to show some support that is one of the best ways you can help us out right now because that is our uh, one of our big goals of 2021 is to grow that youtube channel so hustle and flowchart.tv help the flow bros out huh? help us flow bros <laughs> and we'll help you out too so thank you very much love you peace and uh till next time Bye.